Welcome back to the Carp Chronicles podcast. This is episode number 34, and today we have none other than Bill Cottom joining us, which is a bit of a shock for me to say, to be honest with you, because when we started this podcast around about 18 months ago, I never dreamt that we would be getting guests on like Bill Cottom. Um, we've got John Baker coming up. We've already had loads of wonderful guests. And uh, yeah, it's a bit surreal to be interviewing these guys where for many, many years, you know, I, I was reading what Bill had to write. You know, I was following his bait advice very, very closely. And I mean, obviously he was heading up Nutribates. He was the main man, the owner of Nutribates, you know, which was a company for me that I held in the highest regard. And um, I think they had the best quality stuff going. I think they had the best information out there. And yeah, now I get to sit down and interview Bill. Um, it's just kind of surreal for me. Bill's very, very kindly said that he would jump on these podcasts and, and open up about, you know, the past. We do touch on what happened with Nutribates. Um, and also, you know, lots and lots of bait talk is going to come in this episode. So, I really hope you all enjoy it as much as I enjoyed recording it. I know there's been huge demand for us to have Bill on and yeah, we managed to get him and we had a great chat. He's a super guy, really, really lovely bloke, down to earth and we just basically have a raw chat, warts and all and yeah, I think you're going to find it quite insightful. Before we jump into the episode, of course, this is brought to you by carphuntergiveaways.co.uk. Now, if anyone's interested in a set of shiny new Delkims, these new slender, sleek Delkims that are doing the rounds at the moment, these guys have pretty much always got a set up for grabs on their website. Um, it's a it's a recurring thing for them, I believe. So, if you're anything like me and you like a little bit of a flutter, Go ahead, check them out, carphuntergiveaways.co.uk. Let's jump into this awesome episode with Bill Cotton. What are you drinking? I've got a, a bottle of Pinot. A bottle of Pinot? But it's a little bit early. It's a little bit early for me. I know you said you hadn't been drinking for a while, but what time do you usually start if you do? Uh, 10, quarter past 10, something like that. Is that just a nightcap or are you a bit of a night owl? No, I'm a bit of a night owl. I'm normally f- sort of thumping away on the laptop until 10 o'clock or something and then I turn that off and just relax for a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. You're putting us to shame with your sophisticated wine. I've, uh, oh, man. Yeah, you are. It's yeah. not sophisticated. It's about four quid, I think. It's, it, it, it's not terribly sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. That makes me feel a bit better. Yeah, I'm just on. Uh, I'm on some Stella, and I've got a couple of Camden Hells as well. Which Very nice. My Camdens at the minute. Pete, are you are you teetotaling again? No, no, I'm not teetotaling. Do you know what, mate? I've actually got a cup of tea just just to get lubricated. Get the old vocal cords going, um, but I've got a a steam brew session IPA which I've I've not had before, so that's getting a baptism of fire tonight. And then after, later on, I've got a couple of tributes as well. Good old St Austell Brewery tributes. Oh, nice. St Austell. That's it. Yeah, no, d- down in Cornwall. Do you, do you know it, Bill? Not well. I've got a couple of very close friends who, who live down there, and I've spent a bit of time down there, but I wouldn't mm-hmm. say I'm not. That's it. I'm, I'm guessing Ken might be one of those. Ken, Andrew and Dean. Um, I used to be very friendly with the guys who run Clawford Vineyard as well. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know it. Um, so, yeah, I've been down there. We're actually threatening to come down, me and the wife, because with all this um, not really wanting to fly anywhere, Mm-hmm. We've suddenly thought, you know, there's some some beautiful uh, places in the UK that we've not been to uh, for a long, long time, and, and, and Cornwall's on our list. To be honest, yeah, you, you can't go wrong. It's um, no. get the right get the right time of year. It's nice and quiet, and if you've got friends down here, you're sorted. Yeah, that's anyway. right, absolutely. That's it. There's no no big fish though, or well, not many anyway. <laughs> no, uh, I enjoy a break every year. There's nothing whatsoever to do with it. Mm, I'm sure the wife does as well. Yeah. <clears throat> did you um? Did you used to go down and and fish in Cornwall in the close season, Bill? No, I've never fished down there at all. No. Okay. Fair enough. I know. Obviously, Ken did a lot, a lot down. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, which, which I think he was with you then, wasn't he? Must have been. Um, yeah, he, he was with us from 
day one until I left, to be honest, which is which is one of the, there was about a dozen people who, who were with us from 1986, seven, right through to 2015, 16, 17, when I left. And, you know, that made me enormously proud. I mean, it's, it's very rare in this day and age to get loyalty like that. Yeah, definitely. And and I, I don't know if you ever go on the forums and look in the bait sections. I mean, a lot of it is all, a load of rubbish nowadays and, and just bickering. But uh, yeah, Ken is, it, Ken's very active on the forums. And yeah, he, I'd, I'd, I don't very, contribute, but I know the asset. He's he's always he's still very uh, loyal to to you and and the, yeah, I know he's yeah yeah, yeah. I know he's very loyal chap yeah. It's probably worth saying actually for the listener before we kind of get into the meat of it all. Um, obviously you're not with Nutribates anymore for for those people that don't know. Obviously you know you founded it and and ran it um, at the helm for many years, but um, you're not involved with any bait company right now, are you, Bill? No, I um. RG Bates in Rotherham see fit to to sort of look after me with a uh, from a bait point of view, and I give them a little bit of uh, sort of help uh, here and there. But I'm not involved on a business foot at all. I don't want it if I'm honest with you. You know, I, I had getting on for 35 years of it, and I loved every minute of it. I wouldn't swap a day of it. But you know, I, yeah, I've had my time. Yeah, no, I totally understand that. Totally understand it. I mean. There's so much we want to cover. I mean, it's tricky to know where to start. I'm sure once we do mm. start, we'll go down many different, you know, rabbit holes with all of this. Um, I think to 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 start things off, obviously, you what you're a bait man. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, when when you come up with a new bait, and you obviously you've come up with with many a fantastic bait. Are you designing them for a specific type of angling or a specific water or is it you get an exciting new product it might be a different fish meal well, it, animal and you base it around that how, how do you start to, to to formulate a bait it's certainly not for a specific water because i've always believed that a carp is a carp is a carp mm. um it it varies a little bit i mean there's been times when I was running Nutribates, where we thought we need to to add a higher track bait to the range or a winter bait to the range or a year-round bait to the range. Um, and there's been cases, which was certainly the case with Trigger, where we stumbled on a couple of products, a liquid and a powder, which later became Trigger Powder and Trigger Liquid, and we built the bait around that. Um, so, so it all depends, really. I mean, the trigger always sticks in my mind because I had a, I had an animal feed supplier come to see me and he says, we've done um, exhaustive tests on these and these are the greatest fish attractor you'll ever come across. And you think, yeah, yeah, I've heard it all before. You know, everybody who wants to sell you something tells you that. Mm. But it turned out to be spot on. You know, I've never and don't think I ever will uh come across anything that compares with the original trigger powder. I mean, it's not available in the form that it used to be now. Um, but it just blew me away. I mean, from the second we put it into a bait and started farming it out to a few of the field testers, the phone was just red hot. And I don't think individuals quite cotton on to what's happening. I, I remember having Ken Townley on, I, I mean, we just mentioned Ken, and he said, I've never used anything like this. But so many people reported the same experiences that you know you're on something pretty special from day one, you know, and then it's a case of building that bait around that product. Um, and we did that by incorporating low, low temperature fish meals, krill meal, which was whispered about in those days. It, you know, I mean, it's commonplace now. It wasn't then. Mm. Um and we just sort of messed around and played with this and played with that and built the mix around a product that, in truth, only went in at a few grams a kilo. But that one product was the start of that of that trigger and trigger ice concept. Yeah, interesting. Are you able to to divulge anything about what the trigger powder was, the original trigger powder? <laughs> It's used in the pet food industry. I'm, I mean, it's not fair for me to go yeah. go any further than that. Um, uh, out of respect for Nutribase, but it, it was involved in the pet food industry. Yeah. Um, and a, a pet food company 
had, had stumbled on it as a fisher tractor and, and did a few trials on it. And it sat on a shelf in my office for about 18 months or two years, and I kept looking at it. Yeah, the stink was horrific, you know, with it in its in its neat form. I mean, it was quite pungent. To, I think it was ten grams a kilo or some uh, something we used it at, and it was very pungent in a bait at that. But the neat product was just shocking, and we were just playing around one sort of one day and tried it, and away we went, you know. So there's a lot of luck in these things, you know. We we just stumbled on that and had. Uh, probably 10, 12, 15 fantastic years out of trigger. Yeah. Um, the, the, there was only us had access to that powder at that time. Yeah. Um, but it was it was pure luck. You know, I would never have found that product without the uh, and this sales guy walking in and saying, you know, this is going to change your life. But it did. Yeah. You know, it, re- it really did. Yeah, incredible. It, do, do you think it was the amino acids or the organic acids in there or something else? What do you think was doing it? It was certainly packed with amino acids. Um, I don't normally go in for that type of stuff or the theories too much. I just know that every time we threw it out, you know, we we had amazing results. I didn't care what did it. Mm. You know, but something special happened when we added the powder and the liquid together. I, I, I mean, the liquid wasn't a liquid a liquid version of the powder, but it was along very, very similar lines. And it it was undoubtedly the powder that was a really special product, but using it with the liquid just, tri- just triggered something in it, if you'll excuse the pun, and made it so incredibly special. And, it's, and the Finnish Bay, again, possibly more through luck than judgment, the... And the Finnish freezer bait version was the best big fish bait I have ever come across. I mean, you either believe in big fish baits or you don't, but I've seen it too many times um, for it not to be the case. And that was the best big fish bait I have ever come across. I'm glad you say that, actually, because I was, was going to touch on it at some point. Because um, I know you said it just a moment ago, you know, a carp is a carp is a carp. And I, I guess yeah. what you mean is they've got the same receptors and blah, 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 blah. But obviously, you've just kind of answered it anyway. But you, you clearly do believe that some fish have certain preferences for, for certain things, I'm guessing, yeah? I don't think it's so much that. I think if you believe in the principle of nutritional recognition that, that I undoubtedly do then it stands to reason that the fish that get big are obviously genetically built in a way that they're going to get big. Uh, but they also seem to recognise the, the the good foodstuffs. And the closer you can get to replicating their perfect dietary requirements, the closer I think you get to establishing a big fish bay. I mean... It's not just Trigger that's a big fish bait. You know, there's some other companies' baits. Um, I forget which, which bait it is, but I've got a couple of friends who are avid mainline users, and they're adamant that one of their baits is a big fish bait. I can't remember which one it is, if I'm honest with you. But it's. I think the closer you can get to the perfect sort of nutritional profile, the more chance you've got of that bait being a big fish bait. Uh, a big fish bait. Yeah, are you going into? I mean, I think I think what you mean is you know everything: the protein, the fats, minerals, vitamins, everything. Um, yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody talks about protein all the time. Yeah, but fats, vitamins, minerals, you know, are so so important. Mm. You know, in a way, protein is a bit overrated. I think um, everybody goes mad for protein. You know, it's not not the be all and end all. Vitamins and minerals play. A, a huge part, as do fats at certain times of the year. I mean, I think any lake that sees anglers bait, right, even if it's devoid of, you know, natural food, which none of they've, they've all got nat- some natural food in, but yeah. any lake that sees anglers bait, there's protein in all boilies, isn't there? So yes. they're not going to be lacking, you know, and, and throughout that, they're going to get all the aminos covered, aren't they, from different protein sources? Mm. So. Yeah. Yeah. Did you used to balance up? Uh, I mean, are you a fan of balancing up aminos within one boilie? Not particularly. Um, I, 
I just I, I work on on what a bait does, and if a bait does it, you know, if the bobbin keeps it in the butt, then that bait is correct. Yeah, you know, and the and the confidence you get from a bait like that. When I went on the Graviers on Luke Moffat's Lake. There was about seven or eight really, really big fish in there when I went on there. And I remember the first day we went on, Luke Moffat said to me, I mean, I, he's, a, he's a very close friend of mine. Now, he wasn't then. I, I didn't know him at all. And he says, this trigger then, do you think it'll catch the big one? I said, it'll catch them all. And it did. You know, and that wasn't that, that wasn't my angling ability. They just ate it. Mm. You know, and they ate it and ate it and ate it. And it made it. Not easy, but it made it easier. You know, there, there was no question about that. Yeah, definitely. You were gunning for a, a big linear for a while, weren't you? Did you have that? Yeah, I, I'd, yeah, I had a ball on trigger from there. I, I'd, I'd been fortunate enough to catch all the big ones, uh, apart from the linear, which was one of the fish that doesn't get caught much on there. Um, and that was the last one. And I was almost a bit sad when I caught it because I thought, you know, it's, it's one of the best lakes I've ever fished and some of the best times I've ever had. But at, at the risk of sounding like one of these bounty hunters, which I'm not, when I caught that, I knew my time on there was done, you know? Yeah. yeah. Because every time I hooked a big fish on there or you'd get a take in the night and it'd feel like a bag of cement on the end or whatever, you'd think it might just be, you know? Mm. And once you lose that, it's time to move on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I understand where you're coming from with that one. Um, I mean, Pete will want to chime in now, I'm sure. But do you think you can... Obviously, you know, you're saying that you kind of you hit upon the, the trigger additive and it just, it just so happened that was a big fish bait. Do you think you can try and design a bait to, to single out the bigger fish? I know Pete's trying to do this with some uh, a few big commons at the minute, or a big common, should I say. Yeah, uh, uh, as I said, it's my... I mean, I don't care what other, what other people think. They might disagree with what I say. But as far as I'm concerned, the more balanced profile you've got, the more you fulfil the fish's nutritional requirements, the closer you get to a big fish bait. So the answer is to use a bait that suits their dietary requirements, which does vary a little bit from time of year to time of year. Um, but certainly autumn, you know, back end of the summer that time, you know, that's when the big fish baits really do come into their own. Why do you think that is, Bill? I think they're just eating more and they've got more requirement for food than what they have in May and in midsummer when it's scorching out or whatever mm. yeah no, i mean yeah it, make, it makes perfect sense um you you were talking obviously with trigger is you've got the liquid additive uh you've got mm. the powdered additive as well uh and it's obviously the, the two of those working together um as i guess a lot of guys in the in the bait world would call that working in in synergy do you yeah. sort of see see ingredients sort of like complementing each other or working in synergy is, is a big thing when it comes to you sort of designing yeah baits. without a doubt in some baits I'm, i mean there's certainly some ingredients that when you put them together something special happens i mean it's not always powdered ingredients i mean a high quality pineapple flavor and then butyric acid is another example there is something very very special about that that flavor combination yeah you know, and I, I'm not, I don't claim to be intelligent enough to know what that is, but it's undeniable. No, that's, I mean, that's a classic, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Me, me, me and Sam, we had a, we had a, a podcast recently with, with John Baker, and we were talking about Scopex flavors. Now, obviously, yeah. they're they're based on sort of embuteric as well. Um, yeah. And he was saying sort of how actually people adding embuteric to to Scopex, for example, was was doing the flavor uh, a disservice, but we didn't touch on the, the pineapple thing. But it's an absolute <laughs> classic, isn't it? That? Yeah, you you have to you have to be very careful with butyric because it's very easy to overload. I mean, some people will tell me it isn't. I believe it is, and I'm basing that on feedback from an awful lot of field testers over a lot of years. So mm -hmm. you need to know if the flavour you're planning to use it with has got butyric in its makeup, because quite a lot of them have, like you say, all scopexes have. Or, or the vast majority. Um, 
but John will be right. He knows his stuff. You know what I mean? He's he's a time served bait man. He knows his stuff. Yeah, absolutely. But um, but but when you talk to him, it it really is. Or listen to him rather. It really is just common sense stuff. There's no magic in any of this. You know, there's no there's no magic additive that carp can't swim past. No. You know, it's all about creating the best food source that you can create. Because if you've got a bait that is established as a food source, you know, it makes the job of catching carp so much easier, I can't tell you. You know, if, if you've got a lot of these baits, I've got a friend of mine who I'll not name who who uses the same bait all the time. He never puts it on the hook. He always puts an alternative hook bait on the hook. So you think, well, I've actually put that fish in my pond or the pond at my um, my parents' house. They don't eat it. The fish don't eat it. And he thinks it's great because he's caught all these fish on it. He's catching them all on bright red pop-ups over the top. Mm-hmm. But it's, and so a lot of these baits, fish are picking up occasionally more through cu- sort of curiosity value. Um, but if you can get a food bait established that they accept as an everyday food source, the job of catching them is so, so much easier. Yeah. It's got to be. It's common sense, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, on that note about establishing baits, um, mm-hmm. When, when you're putting something together, what what would you look to uh, to do there? If you wanted a bait to, be, to become established, something you're going to feed year round regularly, it's it's to balance new. You need to balance nutritional profile, as I've just said, and you need to be sensible with the tractors. I mean, a lot of these baits that's around these days, you can set, can smell them from three swims away. That yeah. you really do not need to do that. You know these. A lot of these guys who who design koi feeds and things like this, now I know they're in a confined area, you know, they've got no choice but to eat it, really. But make no bones about it, they know an awful lot more and have chucked an awful lot more money at it than any bait company has, and they don't put 10 mil of strawberry in it. No. <laughs> no they don't. They don't. No. They don't. I mean, I... I had a few meetings and we had a few trial products from a company who, a lot of years ago now, specialised in making feeds for London Zoo, for the reef fish that they have have in aquariums there. And I was fascinated by what they were doing and and likewise he was fascinated about what we were doing. And when he came to our place and looked at the rows of flavours, he was just in disbelief. Mm. Absolute disbelief. But in saying that, He's not got to compete against his fish. Have not got to compete against any other bait, or they haven't got to pull them in from hundred yards away. You know, they're they're um, like a caged animal, aren't they? You chuck it in the eater, but but they still know an awful lot about fish diets, and and they don't. You know, you can smell the fish, you can smell the spirulina products like that. They don't put fruit flavors in them or monster crab flavors in them. No, no, absolutely not. Um, that's it, and I think a lot, a lot of these 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 koi feeds, etc. It's all very very digestible, isn't it? They're, yeah, a lot of, they use a lot of wheat so. germ, and they want it to yeah. go through the fish. Um, that's a very underrated product, wheat germ. Very very underrated, particularly in colder water temperatures. Is that just for gut transit time or something else? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. Just before we move on, because I can feel we're going to move on, when you're saying about um, establishing a bait, I mean, are you of the mindset that, you know, you you get a a bloody good bait put together and then you pre-bait with it, you need that water to see a lot of it and it gets better and better? Or are you more of the mindset, um, similar to, to John, actually, not to keep harping on about John Baker, but similar to his mindset, whereas if it's a complete, you know, very good food source, you don't need to really introduce it. What are your thoughts with that? I don't think I don't think you need huge quantities of a very, very good bait. I mean, there is a lot of baits around that you see in the press catching loads of fish all the time. But if you look behind the stories and look carefully, most of the fish that are caught tend to be on waters that are absolutely dominated by that bait. 
Yeah. Now, if everybody's putting sugar puffs in, you'll catch them on sugar puffs. You know, the really good baits are the baits that one guy can walk on a water that's dominated by another bait and be successful. That's a yeah. good bait. Yeah. But obviously, the more the more bait a particular water sees, the more it's going to get established. But I mean, most of my fishing is abroad now, or my, my serious fishing anyway. I'm never going to get a bait established, mm. but or it might take me three seasons on the same water. But they remember if that food source is that good. I, I, I absolutely believe they remember. You can, do you think you can do that in three seasons? But depends um, how much you go. Wow, well, I was just <laughs> going to say, actually, I was presuming once a season, you're probably over there all the time, aren't you? <laughs> well, no, no, not as much as people think, Billy. No, fair and not, not as much as the missus says either. <laughs> but but, yeah. but but I, I, I'm i fishing the water now. I've been there three years. I've been fishing it three seasons. I've probably had eight trips. That bait is better there now than it was on that first trip. Yeah. Said, how how much uh, have you put in over the eight trips? Not not an awful lot. I probably if I go for a week on that particular water, I normally work on about thirty kilo for the week. Okay. Okay. P- plus a bit of hemp, bit of maize or whatever. But in terms of boil, it's about thirty kilos. Yeah. Yeah. You see when you. When you're trying to be selective with the better fish, which is what I always aim to do, it, it, it's very difficult to say, but you don't particularly want to pull loads of fish into your swim. You want to fish where you think them big ones might be, and very, very often the big ones, particularly the ones that don't get caught a lot, tend to be loners. So you're not looking to pull a great herd of fish into your swim, a great shoal of fish into your swim. You want to just steadily pre-bait it in that area and hope that, that a big one or a couple of the big ones are picking away at it. And over the course of the week, I mean, when I go, as I said, trying to be selective with the better fish, I'm looking for a result in the week. I don't care if it's Friday morning. You know, I'm very often, you know, they talk about big fish Thursday. There's something in that. Because the confidence builds up, builds up, builds up. Um, but I'm not looking to to pull fish from all over. I'm looking to to pinpoint where that big one might be, and and the fish that I, I've always I watched a lot of fish at the Graviers. It's an ideal lake for watching them. And there's there was three fish in there. The linear being one of them. Uh, that got caught very, very rarely. There was a fish called the linear, a fish called the inflatable, which hardly ever got caught when I was fishing it. And I saw I saw them fish in the water quite regularly. And every time I saw them, they were on their own and as far away from the vast majority of fish as you could ever imagine. And and them to me are the fish that don't get caught. Not because they're cleverer, not because they know what colour your lead is, but because they're loners, they never get in that competitive feeding situation. And that, to me, irrespective of size of fish, it might be an 18-pounder, irrespective of size, the fish that tend to be on their own are the fish that don't get caught so much. Yeah, what, so what is that? Uh, it makes sense, and I, I actually agree with you. I, I've never fished abroad, um, and I've never caught fish as big as you. But uh, in the UK, you know, for, for what would be big fish in the waters I fish, I know what you're saying, but what is that? I mean, do you think they've obviously, they have to eat a lot of food to get that size. Do you yeah. think, and I'm sort of actually going on to a different subject now, but do you think the really old ones can maintain that size and weight with a minimal amount of food because maybe the metabolism goes down like an old, like an old human would? Or what do you think is going on there? I don't think these fish that are loners are necessarily big ones. I mean, you tend to talk about the big fish that don't get caught much because yeah, people talk exactly. about big fish. You, yeah. you don't go to Luke Moffat's Lake or Dream Lake and say, oh, that 17-pounder with a broken scale lab. Uh, with a broken tail, that only comes out every three years. Nobody mentions it. No. So I don't think they've got to be big fish. I just think they're fish that 
like it on their own. I mean, I don't know what thought process fish have got. I don't think it's anything like what people perceive it to be. Um, but there's something going on with them. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I see. You see it in. I think you could probably witness that in every lake. Or oh yeah, vast, I do. Vast majority of lakes, I think. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I do. There's it. always. I, I mean, I always think most of the lakes I've spent a lot of time on in recent years. I always think probably thirty percent of the fish make up seventy or eighty percent of the captures. Yeah. 70 30 rule, isn't it? Well, I'm guessing, but something like that, you know? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, there's an awful lot of them that don't get caught at all. Uh, um, an awful lot of them uh, uh, that don't get caught much. And I think there's a handful that never get caught. And so, not, not, not necessarily big ones. I just think there's a handful of fish that never get caught. Yeah. No, no, I understand. I understand. So, I mean, something like fishing overseas. How do you, oh, geez, how do you target out the ones that you want? That just seems like a you know, impossible task, or is it just it, a number? It is. Yeah. Depends on the water. I mean, I I think there's things to, you can do, um, both baiting wise, presentation wise, tactic wise, that increase your chances. I mean, I think longer hook lengths massively increase my chances of the better fish. Now, I've had this conversation with a, a few of the corner boys who have forgotten more about rigs than I will ever know. And, and they think I'm talking absolute rubbish. But it works for me. Now, I'm sure I'm sure using longer hook lengths cost me a few smaller fish over the course of the season. Um, but I don't care about that. You know, I think... I think spotting 15 kilo of seeds out when you get there and trying to pull fish from here, there and everywhere does not increase your chances of the better fish. I don't. Mm. You know, I I have a... I'm not putting it down to skill. I'm not blowing my own trumpet, but I have an uncanny knack of not catching many, but catching the biggest. Or I have had. I mean, you go through spells when it doesn't happen. But it's it happens too much to be and too much to be coincidence. I think you build up sort of confidence in a tactic. I mean, I'm hopefully going back to this lake in May. There's one big fish in there that not been out for about two and a half years, and I think I've got a hell of a chance of catching it. I mean, I haven't. If you look at the odds, I most certainly haven't. But I I believe I'll catch it, and I think that's a lot of it. Yeah, interesting. Do you, do you think there's anything you can do with bait to to try and favour the bigger... F I, I know, I, I don't want to go over old ground, I know you've said about, you know, nutritionally complete, etc., and that, that's obviously really valid, obviously. Um, some people think certain additives, uh, some people would say, like, different squid derivatives, etc., would hold preference with the bigger fish. Do you see anything like that happening from your fishing for big fish or, or not so much? I've never seen it. No. I've never seen it. I mean, it's very easy to draw a lot of these conclusions after the fact, isn't it? You know, you mm. can say, oh, oh, I put squid in that and I've had a big one. Mm. You know, if you'd have put strawberry in, you might have had the same fish. It's very difficult. Mm. I mean, there's so many, a lot of the writers these days are so wise after the event and, and, and a lot of them, God bless them, come up with the theories after the fact and you think well we can alter that you know mm. but um I, th I think your best chance of, it, of being selective is is the way is the way you apply the bait and your presentation mm. i really do and boilies you know big there are exceptions i catch small fish people who fish seeds will catch big fish but generally speaking big fish eat boilers that's why they're big fish. You yeah. know, they don't they don't get to seventy five pounds, eighty pounds by eating plastic sweet corn every day. Believe me, I ain't got to be the way I look now by eating celery every day. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's true, isn't it? It's true, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah. No, yeah, no, it's it's a valid it is a valid point, and I suppose it's just. I, I mean, I've only really I've never thought about this because fishing abroad has never really done it for me. It's starting to interest me more the older I get, actually. But it must be a lot harder targeting the bigger fish because in you know the lakes that you can visit a lot, you can watch the water, you can see the, where the the big fish, your target fish, you know where they go. It's it seems easier, and I suppose just fishing abroad is. It it, it is amazing. tough. It's tough because. You know, the sessions I've got booked in France this year have been booked 18 months. I can't book them according to the weather. Exactly. Mm. You know, I can't book them when I know the particular fish I'm after I ain't been out for two months. It might come out on the Friday as I arrive on the Saturday. You know, so there's a lot of luck. Mm. Um, but, you know, you've got to believe. I mean, people laugh at me. I think self-belief is absolutely huge. I do. Yeah, you've got to be confident, have you? Absolutely. But, you know, I, mm. I talk to people on the bank. They don't talk like they believe they're going to catch the fish they want. I don't have a doubt in my mind that I'll catch it. I don't know how long it'll take me, but I'll catch it. How does that track? Do, do you think that is just the case of then if you're confident, you're going to stick at it, you're going to apply yourself, you're going to be more on the board? Do you think that's it? Or do you think there's something else there? I just think in any walk of life. I mean, if you, I'm sure if you talk to a professional footballer who's a, a centre forward, yeah, it's good. If he's con- if he's confident of scoring, he's still the same player. But he's going to score more. Mm. Yeah, you know, I've I've always been a believer that you can achieve anything you want if you try hard enough and if you believe it. If you don't believe it, you're wasting your time. You waste time going. Mm. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Very, very interesting and very valid point. Okay. Um, switching back on to bait, obviously that's that's what the most of our listeners kind of tune mm. in for, our, our in-bait depth, uh, sorry, our in-depth bait talk. Um, we've got to talk about Enervite, which, you know, when that came on the scene, obviously it it, it was lighting everything up, wasn't it? You know? Yeah. Um, what do you think it was about Enervite that made it so successful for so many people? I think, as with a lot of these things, I think it was right place, right time. I think it was what the market was crying out for. Uh, There's a very, very good base, very, very good attractors in there, more of a a short-term bait than a long-term bait. Um, And another thing it had going for it in terms of why it was successful is for about three years, everybody in the dog was using it, uh, which is a, which is a, a, you know, a hell of a good starting point. The more people use it, I mean, we couldn't, I don't know when it would be, 88, 89, we just couldn't mix it fast enough. I mean, we weren't mixing in the quantities that the bait companies do now because the market's changed so much. We could not bag it up fast enough. You know, but it's, uh, I often think that bait now, you know, I mean, I fish in France a lot of the time now. With the temp- with the water temperatures over there now, I often think, I bet nobody takes 30 kilo in a while. And mm. everybody's fish real crazy. And, and, you know, w- once it's a good bait, it's always a good bait as far as I'm concerned. And mm. it, um, I'm sure it would do so, so well overseas. But there's a, we, we used to use a, a five spice uh, I, powder in there, yeah, yeah, and just a fabulous smell. And it's one of them, it's one of them bakes. And every time I saw it, well, I mean, it was me who used to mix it in 88, 89, but later on in the in the company's life, I'd sort of arrive at work at nine o'clock, and you could smell whatever was. Uh, I'm go- I'm going on that particular morning. And every time the guys were mixing Enervite, you just think, yeah, you know, it's just right, it just smells so right. Mm. There was a, a very good yeast that we used to use in there. I mean, I'm a, I like yeast. Um, good yeast, mixed spices, Robin Red. And it was just a great combination. I mean, I, I, I used it a lot on the mangrove in Shropshire. Mm. And it absolutely took it apart. You know, there was a couple of us, myself, and Brian Garney, uh, I'm using it on there for a couple of years, and he took the place apart. You know, mm. it's, a, uh, it's one of them baits. I think where when they get on it, they stop on it. 
Mm. Yeah, they just want it, don't they? I mean, the 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 five spice. What is that? Just Chinese five spice? Was it a different five spices to what we would buy if we just ordered five spice? What was it? It just used to be called five spice. It was cinnamon, clove, cardamom. It's that long ago. I can't remember. Yeah. Cinnamon, clove, cardamom, possibly cassia. But it just smelled absolutely wonderful. It really did. Yeah. You had liver in there as well, right? Yeah, we had liver in there. Um, yeah. Liver. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Robin Red, a couple of other bird foods. My memory's going, do you know? <laughs> it's not made anymore, isn't it? I mean, I was... I, I mean, I, was, I don't know. You, you know more uh, than I do. It's a great shame because... Well, it's not a great shame because from selling so much of it, the sales of it did peter off when the old world meant went fish meal crazy but it would catch a lot of fish still and a lot of waters up yeah no doubt you can't you can't remember the recipe uh i've got it <laughs> right okay <laughs> fair enough so nice. but it's a uh, the the problem is so many other baits these days they're all so similar to one another mm, yeah you know, they, you look at Sticky's flagship, I can't remember the names, but you look at Sticky's flagship bait and RG's flagship bait and Nutribate's trigger or whatever, they're all along similar lines. And I think I think Enervite was so, so different. And I think, as I said, it was right place, right time. I've been, I've been using a, a sort of... I haven't been using Enervite, but like a homage to it for one of a better phrase this winter, you know, it, it like a, a spicy red bird foods, um, essential oils, bit of liver. I guess it, I guess people just, uh, hold fond memories of it, don't they? And, yeah. I mean, it, it was, I can't take a lot of credit for it. I mean, it was Tim Pays's brainchild more than mine. Yeah. Um, but it was a terrific bait. Really, really was. Mm. Mm. yeah there we go something else that had, i mean you did a few different um additives that, that had a spice element to um you did the arouser which was another one that was really well respected obviously that's no longer that's long gone isn't it yeah arouser was a blend of essential oils we didn't blend it we bought it in how it was um, that was an anim uh, animal feed product as well. Is it? But that was, hmm. yeah, I, I inherited that from a friend of mine, uh, Nick Elliott, who sadly not, uh, I'm not, uh, he's not with us any longer, but he used to have a the first sort of specialist shop in the area where I live in Sheffield called Bankside Tackle. And he used to do a, a little range of products that I think he used to call Bankside Boosters, I think, and Arouser and Cajola were two of them. And when he packed up the shop, Tim and myself bought what he had and we continued um, Cajola and Arouser. And uh, they were very good, very, very good. Cajola was, uh, wasn't that a creamy powder? Like yeah, very, or something. yeah, it was Pancosmo, yeah. Oh, very, right. very, very pokey on the nose, but a lovely product. I think that's still available. Certainly oh. should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, do you know what the essential oils were in Arouser? No, I don't. No, okay. okay. You'll probably dig it out, but I don't know off the top of me. No, 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 yeah, no. I mean... I essential oils actually it was it was your writings and nutribase that got me into essential oils uh years ago um the cinnamon leaf uh, you did a cinnamon essential oil. i'm i'm pretty sure it was the cinnamon leaf wasn't it that you used it was the leaf yes, version it was yeah um yeah. did you ever did you ever use the bark version did you ever mess around with different types of cinnamon oils what were you finding yeah i mean when Tim and myself started Nutribase, we did an awful lot of messing about with essential oils, and we got four, five, six varieties of most of them. Um, and I actually preferred the smell of the cinnamon bark, but yeah. the cinnamon leaf was the one that caught. Yeah. You know, cinnamon cassia was another very, very good one. 
yeah, I want to come to cassia in a minute, actually, if that's all right. But <laughs> the, the cinnamon leaf, what it, I mean, it's got a lot more um, eugenol in it. The bark, yes. the bark version has got eugenol in, but nowhere near as much. And it's got some other bits in as well. Do you think it, it was more successful because of the higher eugenol content? Do you rate eugenol? What, what are your thoughts? I don't rate it on its own, but there is there is a pattern with high inherent eugenol levels and good, and good attractors. Um, in fact, uh, we were talking about John Baker. I watched a little YouTube clip of him making bait this afternoon, and he mentioned Eugene all of this. Again, he's spot on. He, you know, there's, there's something special in it. Although, on its own, um, I was quite excited when we got hold of uh, I say Eugene on its own, but it it did nothing for me on its own. But as an ingredient for a flavour, I think it's terrific. And I think quite a lot of essential oils have got you. I've got Eugene in them, and it, there does seem to be a bit of a pattern there. Yeah, you could clove is obviously got quite yeah. a bit of Eugene in. Yeah, 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 I mean clove was, I think, <clears throat> just just about my favourite essential oil, clove and cinnamon. Yeah, yeah, clove in, in cold weather is just terrific. You you wrote about years ago. You wrote about um, well, maybe not that many years ago. You, you've been going at it a lot longer <laughs> than I have, but um, yeah, you did your Madagascan clove and your Guava, was it guava? Guava, yeah. We, that, um, yeah. I, I used to use Bob Baker's guava, right? At, at Richworth Guava, and then we, um, we jumped on it and launched our own guava, which, yeah. in truth, was never quite as nice as Bob's. Um, I never thought, but um, clove and guava, yeah. Again, very, very special together, and cl- clove with cream flavors as well is. You know, pretty special. Yeah. Did Bob get his guava from R.D. Campbell's? Or was it else? No, he won't tell me. You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I asked him. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, interesting one. The, um, we just spoke about the, the Casia. You had a product called, um, Casia Terps. Ter- terpenes, ter- yeah. Terpenes, yeah. Yeah. What was that? just casea essential oil or was it slightly different than a than a normal essential oil uh, it came into us classified as a terpenes and we always we always believed that you put stuff out as what it was um so that's what we bought it in as and that's what we sold it out as right okay we had a we had a clove terpenes as well that was distinctly different to the the Madagascar clove. Have you used Casia essential oil? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, a it, lot in, year, in years gone by. Yeah, yeah, different from the the terpenes version or not? Not quite as good, I don't think. Right, <laughs> Casia essential oil and and big commons. Have you ever noticed any any uh, theme with that? <sighs> We thought we did. Um, Casey and Molasses had an uncanny track record of pulling big commons or, yeah. or pulling commons, but I'm not. I'm not sure. You know, again, if you get a few guys using it, I mean, I used to think a few of my mates were using it on Patsville Park. If you, if you remember Patsville Park, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they did very, 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 very well with the commons. But in truth, there were loads of commons in there. Yeah. You know, so you've got to be careful when you conclude these things. Mm. Um, I find it hard to believe that... I have written about it in the past, about these products that that pull big commons. I find it hard to believe when I think about it now that it it can be the case. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Fair enough. Nutmeg um, is another essential oil that's... Well, I say it's similar. I kind of class like nutmeg and clove and cinnamon and... Yeah. yeah. Cinnamon. They're cinnamon... Sorry, cinnamon. They're similar kind of things, aren't they? Um, Nutmeg's an interesting one. Nutmeg in general, nutmeg powder is quite interesting on paper. Is that something you've ever had a mess with? Not the powder. Um, 
the oil was quite popular in the early days, although I never, I never thought it did as well as the the early testing suggested it would. Mm. Um, it tend to need, it tended to need a very very good flavour with it. And then you've got the argument: well, would yeah. that very very good flavour have caught them anyway? Mm. You know, so I don't think I haven't used the powder. I've seen it. I haven't used it. I don't think nutmeg essential oil is one of the best, if I'm honest. What What do you rate up there in terms of essential oils as the best, or do you think it's it's time of year dependent? All All depends what you're putting in, what type of base mix you're putting them in. But if I had to pick my top half dozen, I would say clove, cassia, garlic, asafoetida when we could get it. Mm. Um. Juniper, geranium, you know they're all they're all very very good ones. But clove, clove and black pepper are, are very very special. I mean, I used to use black pepper a lot, and I went off it because I saw how much we were selling it, and I thought, you know, everybody in the next swim is going to be using this. It's just outrageous when we first watched that, you know, how much we were selling. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, it's definitely a popular one. The garlic, oh, a good one. yeah, the garlic essential oil, they they seem to vary a lot, and like the people I've spoke to who I would class as kind of you know knowing knowing their their stuff about bait, it's got a bit of a divide. Some people absolutely rave about it. Some people saying that nah, it's it's you know it's 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 not the one to go for. Can you tell us, or maybe is it different types of garlic essential oil? Is it how it's used? What are your thoughts on that? There are quite a lot of different garlics. I mean, the, we got garlic oil from the the Cheshire Shropshire lads who were very much into garlic and blue cheese, and garlic essential and blue cheese flavour mm. uh, in the early days. And it's not a smell that I think is fabulous on its own, but it is very, very good with cheese or cream flavours. Mm. But it's not it's not one I've ever used a great deal. What what is that? So cheese and garlic. I mean that in my head that that sounds like a tasty meal, right? I'm almost sound. Well, what I, is it I about think that's that what that works with carp. Is it just our? Is it just us making that connection, or is it something else? I think initially, I think initially, I don't know who first came up with it, but I think initially that was what we thought. Um, that you know that was well together. But I think it's like we said earlier, you can just stumble on these things that are very special together. I mean, when when we stumbled on pineapple and butyric, I mean, there wasn't any anything to suggest that they'd be so special. But as we said earlier, some things you can just put them together and magic happens, you know? It, yeah, it's interesting. Mexican onion oil was another one that you used to use, which is ridiculously strong i use that and i'm sure it was recommended in in one of the nutribates um write-ups or something like that i used it with the cheese you had a cheese flavor didn't you yeah was that a yeah we, was we, it under the counter one said, was it or not uh no i don't think so no it was one of the elite flavors right. we yeah. um myself and brian garley used leak oil on the mangrove and then when the supplier leak oil ran dry, we uh, we moved on to onion, um, just on its own. But I think again, cheese and onion. I think I think people just thought oh, it sounds like crisp. Yeah. We'll try that, you know. And then it's self fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? Because loads of yeah. people are trying it, and there loads of people yeah. Are catching. Yeah. yeah, that that is a very important thing about bait, like we mentioned earlier. You know. You've got to be careful about how you rate baits, because if half the country's using it, there's going to be a lot of fish caught on it. You know, it, it, there's so much truth in that. You know, it's um... yeah, yeah. It, it's a, a lot of people. That's their argument about uh, the cell, mainline cell. Um, I mean, this is not in my opinion, but a lot of people would say it's absolute crap bait. But because a lot of people use it, it catches well. I think there's probably got to be more to it than that. <clears throat> but I think there's an element of that because it, you know, it, it, as I said, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I've got a lake down the road, and everybody who... I mean, I'm not being cr critical of Sal, because I think a bait that catches that many fish has got to have a lot going for it. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, it's but, not shit, but, it, you know. But, but there's a lake just down the road from where I live. Everybody uses cell on there. And you walk round and they say, oh, I use cell because everything's coming out on it. And you think, well, yeah. you will do. Yeah. You know, but it, it, it is a good... I, I think mainline get the attraction spot on. You know, yeah. and there's, there's, something, the, there's something going on in there. The thing is, it might not be the most balanced nutritionally, or maybe it is. Who, who, we don't know, do we? No, we but don't it's know. definitely something that the fish want to eat. You know, that is that that we do know. Otherwise, they wouldn't keep eating it, and the same fish wouldn't keep getting it uh, caught. No, I, I mean, on top of that, there's an awful lot of anglers whose opinion I respect. They'll tell you that it's the best bait they've ever used. Mm. Now, you know, you, you've got to be aware of that and think, yeah, you know, they they're not all full of crap. Yeah. So if if you fish that, if you were to fish that water, would you do what? Well, what, what definitely me and Peter do. I think most people we know would do. We would use like a you know real real high fish meal content boilie. Is that the way you'd go? I'd just take the bait I use. Or would you just wouldn't even? I'd, I'd, I'd take our I'd take our G bait formula with Arctic crab, which is what I've used everywhere I've gone for the last. Two two and a half years, I don't care what anybody else is doing. Yeah. Just don't care. Yeah. You know, a good bait will stand up against anything. Yeah. I mean, I've been on lots of baits, uh, on lots of waters abroad where there's a house bait. I never take it. No. Never ever. And you wouldn't seek to go total polar opposites to it, just to... No, I, I use what I use. I mean, yeah. I mean, the biggest mistake so many people make, I think, would be the, the choice is bewildering. Absolutely. I mean, it must be, because I know a bit about bait. Not as much as people perceive me to, I know a bit about bait. When I left Nutribates, and, and the way I left really meant that I wasn't going to use Nutribates products anymore, I honestly didn't know where to start. You know, I, I, I was very, very lucky to get some very, very nice offers from bait companies. But I sat down with the missus and I said, "Look, I know we've been left in a financial position that we didn't know about, but I'm selecting the bait that gives me the best ch chance of being successful as a carp angler." You know, I'm not I'm not in this for a few quid. You know, my, my fishing is more important than that. But when I started looking, my God, you know, I didn't know where to start. And that's and that's from somebody who's been in the bait industry for 35 years. You know, I, I knew bait companies who I trusted. I knew bait companies who I didn't particularly trust. But I honestly did not know where to start them. But, you know, I, I thought I found a bait here that suits me. And that's the important thing, you know. The bait that suits Terry Hurton might not be the bait that suits you if you fish one Friday evening twice a month. You know, you've got to pick the bait and apply it in a way that suits you. And people, so many people don't do that. You know, Daryl Peck uses this bait, so it's got to be the bait for me. It might not be. You know, and these people have got to be, the bait companies are, or at least should be, there to help you. You should be to pick, pick the phone up or talk on social media, whatever they do these days, um, and say, right, I fish two Thursdays a month. I never fish the same lake twice. I don't fish in winter. What's your recommendation? Mm. And if the bait company's got anything about them at all, that should be part of the service they provide. Yeah, definitely, it should be. I maybe I'm. No, being... they don't, but they don't all. No, I I can't. Maybe I'm being too negative here. I can't see it happening. I mean, I might be wrong. I I obviously you won't remember, but um, iPhone Nutribates probably getting on for fifteen years ago now. Maybe not quite that, but um, yeah. And you answered the phone and, and you helped me out with a few. You, I think it was at the time I was in a quandary about GLM and and there was a different thing mm. about essential oils. You know, and you're very helpful, and and you you spent the time with me. I yeah. can't see that happening with a lot of companies these days, unfortunately. The world's yeah. changed, though, hasn't it? I, I yeah. mean, I I had occasion to speak to 
uh, I'm doing a series of reviews on, on some products for carpology at the minute. And I had occasion to spoke, speak to a, a tackle company, which I won't name yesterday. Um, it took me 40 minutes to find the phone number. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Because they don't want you ringing them. You know, they want you to just, you know, follow them on YouTube, follow them. And there's nothing like, I don't care who you are, there's nothing like picking the phone up and talking to, I mean, I used to, the, there was good in it and bad in it, but I used to employ reasonably experienced or very experienced car pangers. Now, the bad side of that was that no, none of them wanted to work in summer. The good part of that, <laughs> the good part of it is that, you know, they could all offer advice. And I'm going to say, if, if I want to replace my van, I want to talk to somebody, not, not click on Facebook, look at pictures. I want to talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about, because I don't. I don't know what I'm talking about in that, in that part, in, in the world of vans. I know what I want. I know what I need. I don't understand them, so I want to talk to somebody who does. And people are just like that with me, but it's, I think it's gone all that. It has, yeah, it has. And I think yeah, maybe a bit of the passion's gone as well. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know. You, I mean, you seemed, you seem pretty, you know, happy to help me. And, and, you know, you could say you're pretty passionate about helping me. Maybe that's gone. I know we keep mentioning well, John well, Baker. He's the same, he, you know, he'll spend time. I was just after time. your money. I was just yeah. after your money. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. Uh, <laughs> no, no, but 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 John, John's like me. He's a bit old school. Yeah, you know, that's the way he was brought up in the bait industry. And I'm sure Mike Wilmot and, and people like this are exactly the same. Um, they know the stuff and they'll give you time. I mean, a lot of these companies, um, you ring up. And you get a young lady who runs accounts or receptionist or whatever, or, or a young fellow. I'm not being sexist. They don't go fishing. I ain't no good if you if you if you want advice on bait. Hmm. You know, you want to talk to somebody who's who's used big fish mix, who's used sell, who'll tell you what the best flavour to put in B five is. You know, you don't just want. A receptionist will tell you the product code, how much it is, and where the nearest stock is. They don't tell them anything. Uh, yeah, definitely. But, but the world's changed, hasn't it? It has. Yeah, it has, and I think it's probably going to change even even more. To be honest with you, just the way it's yeah, going. It is. it's just going to gather gather steam and and get worse in that respect. And don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. there's, some, there's some good. We're in an instant age, aren't we? And there are some good points to that. You know, we can't all be doom and gloom. But yeah, the, yeah, of course there is. The, the per, you know, the personable side of business is certainly seems to be dying out, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, you mentioned big fish mix. We, I'd love mm. to chat about that. Obviously, that you know, David Moore's. Um, I think it was his uh, recipe anyway. I'm pretty pretty damn sure. Yeah, it very much so. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Bef before we move on, we were talking about essential oils. I know Pete will kill me if we don't talk about garlic essential oil more i know pete's mm. looking into garlic at the moment and garlic essential oils um pete you got any questions for bill on on garlic i know you're even fermenting your own garlic at the moment aren't you i am yeah um so that that's purely from a i'm not a, look, looking at the good bacteria essentially uh that could come from that i don't know if you've got <laughs> sam's just sort of jump jump me on that one but i don't know if you can expand on on garlic as a as a health benefit for carp at all? Yeah, again, there's nothing. It seems to be a health benefit for most of God's creatures, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Dog, dogs particularly. I mean, we've always kept dogs, me and the missus. And, and garlic's a huge deal for them. Liver's a huge deal for them. Mm -hmm. Garlic and liver together is a pretty exceptional. Yeah. Um, but it, it's... I can't say to your hand on heart that, yeah, they improve the health of a car because I, I don't know for sure. I mean, I tend to think things that do one creature good, there are exceptions, but things that do one creature good will tend to do another creature good. Um, and there are health benefits to garlic, undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. um, as there are to things like honey and nectar and things like that, you know. So I think, I think, 
it's valid, but it's not black and white, I don't think. No, and did you use any any sort of like powdered form of garlic, or was it was it? Yeah, I used garlic oils? powder. Yeah, we we messed about with garlic powder when we put the blue oyster bait together. Um, we we only included it in a couple of trials um, and never pursued it. But the bummy garlic powder it tends to overpower everything. Yes, um, and I'm not I'm not a lover of products that overpower everything the the five spice in in any vibe probably being an exception because that overpowered everything but it was a wonderful smell you know garlic isn't one of them smells that i particularly want overpowering a bait no absolutely and it's like with me with with my sort of my tinkering and my experimenting rolling small batches just to just to play with uh like yeah. garlic essential oil so i want to try and use like a, the, the powder form and the essential oil um, but using the essential oil, it's so hard. Like one drop goes seriously far. Um, the stuff I've got at the moment is incredibly overpowering, like you say. Yeah, you you need to cut it a bit. I mean, if you... Um, almond oil is, is the best oil to cut an essential oil with. So mm -hmm. if you put 10 drops into 10 mil, yeah. you can then go down to using half a mil or quarter of a mil, can't you? Yeah. No. Uh, half a drop or a quarter of a drop. That's it. And if you were sort of blending essential oils, would you would you look to do that on a base with like almond oil normally? Yeah, I mean, we used to do two versions of leak oil. Uh, a pure leak oil, which was a bit overpowering, mm -hmm. and a leak on almond oil, which allowed you to use it at, at sort of lower levels because people couldn't get... I mean, I'm going back to a time when when people used to make six egg mixes which they don't so much do now no. you know they, t they, t they, t they tend to ship a load of it off to a bait roller don't they but wh wh when you were using a six egg mix or a four egg mix even I, I mean the 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 younger ca carp tigers out there will have a clue what I'm talking about but I mean we used to break four eggs into a bowl and add 12 ounce of base mix or whatever didn't we mm -hmm. uh, and in that situation with leek oil with the leek on almond you could use once you'd cut it with the almond you could use a, the equivalent of a quarter of a drop yeah yeah that's a, that is a that is a top tip uh, so so why almond oil is, it, is there a reason for the, for the almond it, it just it just tends to mix well with the essential oils with it, without any uh, emulsification or anything mm -hmm. yeah that's that's the thing i mean i've I've blended oils before um and i've in the past had had difficulties and i've had to sort of like heat them a little bit not not going crazy oh. but just just warm them over over a low heat uh, and that often does yeah. the trick. But, but the almond seems quite quite easy going like that does it yeah it is yeah yeah mm. no excellent um <clears throat> I think you, I, you want to be very careful, you know, heating essential oils because it can help them to blend. It can also explode your house, <laughs> which in uh, which in ideal. No, no, I've got, I've not got that far. I tell, I tell you what, I, everything I do like that though, I have to say, I do it outside on my little gas stove. Yeah, like, it stinks the house out, and yeah, they're pretty oh, volatile yeah. things, aren't they? That's the trouble with essential oils; they're so strong, and the smell lingers so much. I mean, when. When we first started the company, we ran for the first two years in my parents' garage, mm -hmm. um, and they they used to have underfloor uh, central heating. And the boiler was next door to the worktop where we used to bottle everything, and I'd, I'd finish work at four o'clock and think, "Oh God, the house stinks of garlic." Mum's going to be home at five o'clock, and it just you can't get rid of it, you know. It's just horrific. That's it. And the other thing with essential oils as well is they um, they vary hugely. I don't know what it was it was like back then. Um, yeah, I wasn't sort of around rolling bait back back when you were sort of sourcing a lot of these ingredients, but they vary like tremendously. Did you find you were sort of buying them in batches from different suppliers and then just just testing we, we, them there we always tried with all our ingredients and all our additives not to vary suppliers you know if we bought 
black pepper from one supplier, we stuck with it. But you've got to be careful because so many essential oils are cut before you buy them. Yeah. Uh, and so often you're not told. I mean, you know, I know what we used to see for black, uh, pay for black pepper or, or clove. And if you used to see it at a third of a price, you know, you'd get company ring up. Oh, we can do it out for half price. You think, yeah, there's only one way you can do it for half price. That's it. You know, and that's cut it. It's and it's very, very hard to tell. Very hard to tell. Mm. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I've got something something for you, Bill. Um, recently, we had a we did a podcast with Dr. Patrick Mills, Um and he sort of, I don't know if you know know who he is, but he's... I know of him. He's very much, um, his research is, is chemo reception. Yeah. Um, and he sort of like dropped a bit of a bombshell with us that, that betaine's actually not very attractive to carp from it. Yeah, I saw that. I had a little look, I had a little look at that. Mm. Um, have you, because obviously, I imagine you're you're quite an advocate for betaine over the years. Mm. Um, where does that sort of sit with you? Uh, remind me again how many 70s is called, will <laughs> as, I, as I said to you at the start, you know, I don't care whether people listen to me, believe what I say, I know it's made a huge difference to an awful lot of baits over the years and will continue to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, I bow to his knowledge about, you know, the science behind it. As I said here, I don't care about the science. I care, I care how many times that bobbin smacks against the butt. That's all I care about. I'll not. I'll bow to his knowledge because he, guys like him, have got an awful lot more knowledge about about the theory than I have. Mm. But it's not always as cut and dried as that. No, absolutely. And he's very, he's very much. Um, I mean, everything he does is, I'm sure, on the absolute highest standards. Uh, but it's all laboratory tested. And yeah, it's not, yeah. Um... It's like uh, it's like we said about the koi feed. The guys who develop that, the knowledge is unbelievable. But when you're dropping it on the heads in a tank, it is totally different to fishing 140 acre gravel pit with 15 carp. Absolute different world. And I always I always take on board what they say. And as I said to you, I, I bow. I bow to their knowledge. It's many, many times greater than mine. Mm-hmm. But they don't go fishing, or a lot of them. I don't know whether he does or not, but you know what I mean? It's a, it's a different world. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Where where do you see betaine uh, in bait? What, what do you perceive its role to be? I think it's purely attraction. Um, and I think as with so many of these products a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking, well, f- two grams is great, six grams has got to be better. And it's not like that, you know. Right. Most of these concentrated products have got an optimum level. Uh, in fact, virtually all of them have got an optimum level. And it's not all about, you know, just piling it in and making a bit better. There are products that you can do that with. I think Greenlit Muscle, Two grams is great. I think ten grams is better. Mm-hmm. Um, but betaine is certainly two to four grams per pound in old money or half a kilo is spot on. And do you have a preference over the type of betaine? There's obviously two which are widely available to us bait makers. Yeah, I used to like the hydrochloride, but I think I think both I think both are valid. But I, I'm probably saying the hydrochloride because that's the one that we always used to use. Yeah. Do you know what? It's, it's obviously that's that's an acidic one, isn't it? It's sort of. Mm. I guess I've changed tack a little bit with my bait making, um, and I tend not to use betaine HCL now, and I tend not to use too many things like organic acids. That, I know I don't use them at high levels at all, actually, in bait. Um, but I tend to shy away from that now um, with my theory of. Like the carp have a, an alkaline tract, and I think a lot, maybe a lot of acidic items, especially at certain times of the year, might be more difficult to to digest. Um, is that is that something that sort of crosses your mind at all? Or yeah, you've got to bear it in mind, but I don't I don't stay awake at night worrying about it. I've got to say, mm. you know, I I just it's very very easy with bait to make it 
harder than what it has to be. You, you know, and I think it's easy. The more you delve into it, I think the more you can fall into that trap. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. And we, we've had this chat numerous times. Um, I've just recently got into to rolling baits again, which is ridiculous because it takes up an awful lot of time. It takes away from yeah. fishing time now, to be honest for me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, I, th- I guess you can you can start banging your head a brick wall when you when you sort of you go around in hoops and circles and everything sort of you can start at one point you go to X but you always come back to point zero. Um, yeah, uh, you you I fell into the trap in the eighties, early nineties. You can overcomplicate all this. There's no doubt. If I look at the best catchers of carp that I know, I mean Terry Earn, you know he's without equal in my book. Um, he's not messing about like this. He's just a great angler. Mm-hmm. A moment ago, you, um, when you were talking to Pete there, you mentioned GLM. Yeah. What is it about GLM that's that's so freaking good, if you think it's so good? Is it the fact that it contains betaine, DMPT? Is it some else? <sighs> what is it? I think the beat. The, the betaine content is important. Um, I It is undoubtedly one of the best carp attractors I've ever come across, mm. um, particularly at highest levels. Yeah. Um, again, I don't want to keep repeating myself, but I really don't worry about why. No, it just no. is. You know, I mean, when we... I didn't think trigger could be improved when we had the original trigger recipe, but when we used the uh, uh, the high level uh, greenlit muscle, which I think we crystal we christened trigger and then some, um, it just it just improved it again. It's, it's just a mind blowing additive. But I think I think it needs to be using baits that have at least a percentage of fish meal in the makeup. I mean, I, I've i tried it in Enervite. I've tried it in Blue Oyster. doesn't seem to have the same impact, but when you use it with a, a predominantly, or a bait with a good percentage of fish meal, and that's when it, and that's when it comes into its own. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're, you're on about the full fat GLM, not the, Defatted shit that a lot of people yeah. sell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which really annoys me, and I think I've spoken about this with a bit of annoyance since since we ever started this podcast, like nearly eighteen months ago. A lot of the companies they're selling the the defatted GLM like it's you know it's better and blah 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 blah. Some people are saying it's more shelf stable. I get that maybe it is because the mm. fat can't go rancid, but it should be fresh anyway, shouldn't it? But yeah, like you're saying, yeah. it's cheaper. It, it, it's yeah. Yeah, it's almost a waste product, isn't it, if it's defatted? I, I mean, don't know if there's anybody who's selling it, but to coin my mate Ken Townley's phrase, it's about as much use as tits on a ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's, just, okay. it's just, it's just, it's just, no, has no part in a bait makeup, really. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't add a little bit, but it's two such different products. Yeah. You know, the full fat and the de- and the defatted. But it's cheaper. So, then we've got to, we've got to lead on, and I know people will want to know as they're listening to this. Does that mean it's the fat content that's good, or is something taken away by the defatting process? I think there's something taken away. Yeah. yeah. Because the smell, the smell varies from batch to batch. You don't get the same consistency with it. Certainly not. You don't get the same muscly smell. Um, so I think I'm not sure how it's defatted, um, but it's it ain't the same product. It's got a it tends to have a bit of a plasticky smell to it. Yeah, I can't imagine it's a gentle defatting process, is it? No, it's I wouldn't have thought really so. Pretty harsh on the product, and then it's good. Yeah, I mean it, it is almost it is almost it's a bit harsh. It's almost a waste product. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but but the difference in price to the bait companies uh, is huge. Do you, you ever, I don't think there's any such product, but have you ever looked into British mussels, like the blue mussels we get? Well, 
I've not looked at British blue mussels, but I've looked at blue mussels. And if you really dig deep, there's a lot of suggestions that that, that they can be toxic. Yeah. Um, so it's not a route I would go down. I think there's blue mussels and blue mussels. Um, Is that toxic to, to humans or aquatic? Well... Life? I wasn't bothered, to be honest. As soon as I read that, that was me <laughs> done. Was you know, you know, as as a as a bait company, you have got a hell of a responsibility. You know, a lot more responsibility than a lot of bait companies realise. You know, you are you are selling bait with the ob- the object being for tons of it to be chucked at fish. You know, you do have a responsibility, don't you? Yeah, definitely. Hundred percent, I think so. I think people need to to have a bit more responsibility than than they probably think they do because a lot of people don't think about it. And I get it, I get it. You buy a bait, you just chuck it in willy nilly. But I don't think there's that much thought of what is actually in it and how it's going to affect the fish and how it's going to affect the lake. I think, I think culture. generally, I think in the UK generally, the bait companies are quite conscientious. But when you when you go overseas, particularly to Eastern Europe and that, and they, they're selling boilies for one euro fifty a kilo, you think, what is in that? Mm. You know, it scares me to death. And and as a bait company, we, we, we used to have feed companies ring us and say, I don't know if you're interested, but I've got summer product X. It's three months out of date and you're only throwing it to fish. And I used to think, well, some people must be buying this or they won't be ringing around. Napping it up, yeah. 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 And I get it because a lot of the products are so expensive these days. I mean, the fish wheels, for example, have, have gone up exponentially in the years since, since we started. I mean, for as long as I could remember at one point, fish wheels were 350 quid a tonne. You know, they probably... F- 14 and a half hundred quid a ton now. Yeah. So I get it that some of these less conscientious bait companies, they get offered a ton of uh, out of date for 300 quid. I understand it. But, you know, it won't happen in the dog food industry. Yeah. 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 Just, I, yeah, it's, it's not good, is it? And I, it, the no. thing is, is people. It, <clears throat> I think I said this earlier, actually. I don't know how much passion there is in the bait world now. I'm sure there is with many companies, but I think there's maybe a few where it's just a little bit more about money than it is about passion for quality. Well, And there's the there's the problem, isn't it? Because they're going to get these offers of cheaper ingredients, the old stock, and they're going to snap it up. And it's I think it's a problem. The problem these days, I think, is when you look at what I hope people understood that we used to be, and the John Bakers and the Mike Wilmots and quite a few others, they had a passion for it and still have. They, they, they believe in it, they care. A lot of these bait companies now are owned by big international companies who it's just business. You know, and it that's probably why they're driving around in Bentleys and me and Mike Wilmot aren't. But, yeah. you know, I used to care so much. You know, I still do, but obviously it's not it's not my industry now. But but I I used to care so much and, and take the responsibilities, you know, really on board. And I don't think you know, I don't think that happens now. Not with everybody, with some people. It does obviously. And I don't think the anglers care as much as they used to do, you know. So many, particularly when they're going abroad, they just want as much as they can carry for 100 quid, don't they? It's funny, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, the people... You mentioned three people... Well, you mentioned two people there. Um, John Baker, Mike Wilmot, and obviously yourself. Other people really caring, but those are the people that stick out to you who are the real, you know... Not bait gurus, it's a ridiculous name, but, you know, the, yeah. the people who would... You know, people like me and Pete, we, you know, would hang on to, to every word you guys said, you know? So... It's uh, it's just funny, isn't it, that the people that are really, really passionate about that they're, they're so they just so happen to be the people that you really, really trust. Them but they, so you know, it says they, 
the carp anglers and the time served in the industry. You know, um, Alan Parbury at Mistral is another one. You know, he's a time served carp angler. You know, I hear an awful lot about uh, quite a bit of negative stuff. He knows his stuff, let me tell you. He really, really knows his stuff. Rob did, obviously. You know, but the, the common denominator is they, they, they are carp anglers and understand carp fishing. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's so, so, some of these companies now are owned by people or multinationals where the top man probably never caught a carp. Mm, yeah, you know, it, it, can't, it can't be the same. They can't have the same feel for it. And it's... When I look at my time in the bait industry, as I say, I won't swap a day of it, but I probably cared too much about what we were doing and what we were providing. And the accountant will tell you not enough about a dollar. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's if a businessman looked at it, that's what he'd say. I mean, we used to sell our um, high note valve. And we brought high noval back because barber anglers were crying out for it. Mm. We used to make bugger all on it. You, mm. you couldn't, you can't make money on an out and out milk protein bait in this day and age. But then barber anglers wanted it, and I felt, you know, we should provide it for them. And I was proud that we did. If you ask me, accountant, he'd said I was insane. Mm. It's not all about the money, though, is it? Well, depends who you talk to, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, if you if you talk to the guys with the Bentleys, yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, no, but it's, um, it, it's a worry, though, isn't it? Because I mean, who's who's coming through? That's maybe there is some people I just don't know about them. But well, one who's of the, coming I, through that has that passion. That that's I think a lot else. do. I think a lot okay. do. I think Sticky do. I think DNA do. Right. I think Mainline do. Um, one of the reasons I went to RG um, is the young, I say young guy, he's a lot younger than me, I don't know, he'll be in his 30s, Greg, who runs it. He cares so much. Right. And I can I can see, we're very different people, but I can see a lot of me in him. Um, you know, he's, he's building up a very good business and he cares so much, you know, about, about his own fishing, about the fish and by what, He's selling that people, pe people forget all this is food for fish, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I've been, I've been singing from the rooftops for years and years and years, and I used to think that nobody listened about this listed ingredients on on the packaging. You know, you're not going to give the exact recipe. No. But you can't buy ferret food, parrot food, dog food, rabbit food without seeing a full list of ingredients and a full nutritional breakdown. And yet, you know, we can buy tons and tons of bait, throw it in lakes, and nobody's got a clue what's in it. Yeah. It can't be right. Pet. No. It's can't it's be right. Pet. No, it's not right. No. Can't be right. You know, and these things are, everybody's moaning about this Brexit thing and you can't take bait to France and this and that and other you know, we had that for years. You know, you can't export to Serbia. You can't. It's all about getting the correct paperwork, the veterinary certificates, the re the veterinary inspections that we used to have. And I don't know what is required for to export these things these days, but it's doable. It's doable. It, it's just it'll sort the men out from the boys a bit. It, it, I think over a period of time it will sort out the ones who are doing it right from them who are not. Yeah, which will be interesting to see what happens, won't it? Because I think yeah. the, the game's going to change a bit. I mean, so, someone who's obviously massive in the, the UK bait world is um, is Jeff. Did you have any dealings with him? I know a lot of Jeff people. Bowers? Yeah, Jeff Bowers, yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't believe I've ever spoken to him. I was a guy who I was speaking to on social media last year said that he wanted me to to phone him and I never got I 
I'm not good at ringing people from cold, and I never did, but I'd like to. I've got a, from a distance, I've got an awful lot of time for him. He knows his stuff. Sure. Just to swing back slightly. So I know we're all over the place here, but it, yeah, it's the way these podcasts go because we go off on a tangent no, and want... have to bring it back. So the, our listeners are used to it by now. Um, just to quickly touch upon um, GLM again, you mentioned mm. going in at high levels. I know when you said that people would have been kind of like screaming out for what, what you think is a high level. What is it in a feed bait? Would you increase it just for hook baits and alternative hook bait? What's a high level for GLM for you? Uh, in a food bait, 10, 12 grams a kilo, uh, per half kilo. Okay. Ten, sorry, ten, 10 or 12 grams per half a kilo. Per, per half bait. kilo, yeah, which is difficult financially, I get that. Yeah. Um, but it makes an absolutely colossal difference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Would you increase that for hook baits? We do. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um I, f- I think 10, 10 grams is probably the optimum level. I mean, I'm not... I do use boosted up baits, but not not as much as a lot of people. Cool. I mean, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of alternative up baits uh, or a snowman with a, a, a... What do they call them these days? Match the hatch, they call them. Now. There's a oh, bottom one in there. Yeah. Oh, that. that's right. <laughs> That's where it's at now. You've got to, you've got to get all that. You've got to have um, lingo. Yeah, you've got to have all the lingo. But it's uh, a match the hatch on the bottom and a, and a snowman with an alternative pop up on the top. It's yeah. caught me so many fish. I never used to to buy many sort of bright pop ups. I always used to make my own my own bait. Well, and feed, mm. to be honest with you. But your pink pepper pop ups, they did well, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah very. They, mm. they did. It's, bl- it's black pepper, though, isn't it? I mean, it's just a mm. great smell. It, it's it's higher level black pepper, a lot higher level than what you'd ever use in a in a food bait. But they're not eating it. You just want them to pick it up once. Are you, I mean, are you able to say what what sort of level you'd go at in black with black pepper for a for a hook bait? Say, if someone's just knocking up a one egg mix at home, how high are you talking? If about? I'm being honest with you. If yeah. I've been honest with you, I can't remember what, how much yeah. go, um, goes in. And I think it was something like four mil per half kilo, something like that in the black peppers. Crikey. Uh, in the pink peppers, I think. Might yeah. might not be as much as that. Oof. I've been to bed since then. I can't. <laughs> It's high. That is high. That's ridiculously high. Yeah, it might it might have been two or three. Yeah, but it's again the only hook boats. Yeah, yeah. You, they don't eat them. You can do over. You can definitely overdo things in in just hook baits. So I test. I got a, a pond with um, with carp in, and I test the bugger out of them. You can overdo it, can't yeah. you? You know, you, you really can. undoubtedly, yeah, yeah. With okay. with some things, yeah, undoubtedly, yeah. you got more leeway than some that they're going to suck in many, many times and eat, though, haven't you? Of course, and you know they're oh, not yeah. breaking it yeah. up with their pharyngeal teeth, which I think you know stimulates more receptors, doesn't it? So yeah, I know what you're saying. But that's the difference. That yeah. that's the difference. They they're not actually eating it, are they? No, exactly. You just want exactly. you just want them to want to sample it. That's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yes, but you want them to suck it in with enthusiasm, don't you? You want them to take it right back in the yeah. So they... Yeah, you do, but they're still not going to eat it. No, no. Do you look into the the whole, you know, to put it in layman's terms, taste, smell, um, the gustatory response, the olfication? Do you, do you prioritise either of those? Do you try and get a happy medium? Do you look into that stuff, or do you literally just tell, let the fish tell you what they like? I... I... I have done over the years. I mean, Tim and myself used to read and read and read. And, and as I said, you can make it too hard. You can make it harder than it need be. You know, still answer your question, do I now? No. Yeah. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, another thing that you mentioned was um, your blue oyster bait, which I think <clears throat> was... Was that your last... That was your last release bait, wasn't it? At the Helms of Ultra Baits, pretty much? Yes, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I think it had, um, well, I know it had hexanoic acid in it. Um, was it just based around the hexanoic no, acid and the no, it, flavor? Or? No, no, it didn't. It didn't? Caproic, no, no, it didn't have caproic in it, no. I thought it had... No. Caproic and hexanoic are the same, I think. Aren't yeah, they? Uh, the same product, yeah. No, oh, no, it didn't, no. Ah, okay. Where have I got that from? You did something the, with it, didn't you? We did um, a plum and caproic alternative hook baits that were like a purpley colour. You... Uh, I don't know those. Was it a flavour you did then? Did you do... We did the plum... We did plum, plum and ca- about, caproic yeah. as a flavour, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what that, I'm thinking of. That caproic came about because when Tim and myself started the company, I mean, butyric was obviously used by people in those days, but not widely. Um, and we got embutyric and caproic. And in, in truth, we did very, very well on both. Results were, were very, very similar. I, I used... Uh, caproic and juniper oil for a while and because we were limited to what we could do in those days we launched embutyric and I guess you could say the rest is history and we didn't launch caproic Um, and I got a a product list about I don't know 12 years ago from a chemical company and I saw caproic on it and it it just I just thought aye aye you know, no, nobody's using that. So we, um, th- that's where that came about. And I don't think anybody had used it much before then. I mean, Batyric's commonplace now, isn't it? But I don't think Caproic, st- well, I don't, don't think it still is. But I, I know what you mean about the Blue Oyster. It did have a, the flavour we're using now, it did have a hint of that, I guess. It, but, but no, there was none in there. Hmm. I might just have been totally confused, to be honest, Bill. Did they come out about the same time, towards the end? Yes, yes, they did. Yeah, oh, it's probably me, mate. I, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't use any of those. Um, Would probably be, when did it come out? 14, 2014, 15, probably. Yeah, yeah. Which was, was that when you left, pretty much? No, was no, I left... left um, I sold the company in 15. Um, and then the new owner um, got in trouble financially and went bankrupt uh, with a number of companies. Um, and it got bought up by a guy who lives locally to me. And I worked for him for a while and then I left in... God, I can't remember. 18 minutes, 17 maybe, 18, can't remember. So I, I'm i not up on this at all then. It's had two owners since you then, you didn't know that. I sold the company, yeah, um, to the same guy who bought Christon and a, cu- a couple of other companies. Um, he had too much on his plate and went bankrupt. And then the guy who owns it now b- bought it from the liquidators. And asked me if I'd continue to get involved, which I was very keen to do. I mean, I had no, no intention to walk away or to leave at all. It come as a total surprise to me that I had to. But uh, it's the way of the world, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's unfortunate, isn't it? But we. Yeah. I mean, it, it absolutely. When I, when I walked away, it just broke my heart. I mean, I felt. I felt I'd let the missus down and, you know, it had been our livelihood for 30 years. I'd been married 30 years and it, it it was everything we had really. I mean, family apart, nothing, there was nothing on this world I cared about more. Uh, and to walk away, I, I remember dri- driving away, parking around the corner and just bursting into tears. And I thought, this is just pathetic. And then I had to go and, tell the missus that I'd walked away from my job and this and that and the other. I had a, a real bad 18 months for my nerves, but, you know, you've got to put it in perspective. You look at you look at what's happened around the world that, um, 
in uh, in twenty and twenty one, and you think you know, put it in perspective, you know. But it, it broke me out. I'm not denying. I'm not denying. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a tricky one. I know we we spoke before we recorded this on the phone, and we had a Zoom meeting, and we said we weren't going to go into the the whole Nutribates departure thing, but. Is there any? I mean, do you want to touch upon it any more, and you know, let people know? Because I know, obviously, everyone's very interested in it, but at the same time, yeah, it's, it's a personal it's, business, you know. It's a very difficult one to me. For me, I mean, when I sold the company, um, it was for not for the amount of money that I heard banding around. I have to say, but it was for uh, in the world that I live in a life-changing amount of money. I mean, I'm just a fellow from Rotherham, you know? And it was a, to continue to work as a consultant, advisor, whatever you want to call it, and get this this sum of money was just fantastic. And then he went bankrupt and it didn't quite work out how I'd expected. Um, and then the, the company was bought off the liquidator by a guy who I knew of but didn't know personally. And... It did work out, you know, uh, and I ended up walking away. I mean, it's always difficult when I try to see it from both sides. I think he, it, when you've owned something and run something for 33, 35 years, it is difficult when somebody else suddenly owns it. Um, you know, I've had this conversation with a couple of mates who sold companies. It is hard, that. Um, but I was 100% committed, and it, and it just didn't work out. So I, I felt I had to walk away. I owed it to myself to walk away, um, which was difficult financially, you know. Um, I wasn't ready to pack up work. Uh, I think I was 50, 54 years old, I think. I wasn't, I wasn't, there was no plan to pack up work, and I just drove home. Walked in the kitchen and said to my missus, "You better sit down. I ain't got a job anymore." And uh, other than angling, you know, there's not much I can do. I mean, when I left school, I was a a lifeguard and a a tennis coach. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, I'm not quite capable of doing stuff like that now. So there's <laughs> that and YouTube. It's the only two jobs I've ever had. Sure. Um, so I am. Um, it all comes a bit of a shock. We had to, we had to adju adjust our lives a bit, and you know, um, so I, I do a bit of consultancy work now. I'm quite happy with that. C keeps the wolf from the doors, and I do a bit of writing, and so life's very, very different. But if I'm honest, I'm 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 very happy. I'm at peace with the world. I've I've watched my mum and dad. I lost my dad last year. Um, and my mum barely knows who I am. So I've, I've been able to give a bit more time to them. I mean, when I was running Nutribates, I, I, there's mistakes I made. I remember my father saying to me, it'd be about late 90s. We we were doing very, very well. I mean, we, we had money in the bank that I could never have dreamed of. Um, and my dad said to me, you you can't continue on your own. You've got to surround yourself with a few people um, who can take some work off you. Uh, and I didn't. I just thought I could, you know, the guys could look after the warehouse. I could run everything, do all the exhibitions, do all the advertising, do all the, I just couldn't do it all. But I thought I could. Um, and that was one of the, I should have surrounded myself then with, with two or three really good people in the management side of the company, and I didn't, you know, and I look at I look at Danny Fairbrass, and I'm not suggesting for a second we could have been like Corder, but the way the guy started and has surrounded himself with fantastic people is just awe-inspiring. And I should have done that on a smaller scale, but I didn't. And then um, we had an offer to sell the company in... I think it was either 2000 or 2001 from a Dutch company. And it was just toy town money. Absolutely ridiculous. 
and I cared that much. I never, I never even considered it. Um, I just love what I was doing that much. And then one, one thing I never saw coming, I mean, I always thought we had products that were better than most. Well, as good as, good as anybody's, better than the vast majority of stuff that was available. I knew, although I've never been bright, I knew I could write about the products and promote the products. I knew we had contacts in the print industry to produce catalogues and things like that. The one thing I never saw coming, um, and never saw it coming, was the emergence in the bait industry of people who had bottomless bits of money. I just, I never, I never envisaged the likes of Dynamite coming. And I do admire dynamite in many, many ways. But I never envisaged the bait industry would be entered by p- people who, or companies who had that much money to chuck at it. Mm-hmm. And I was just a fella from Rotherham, you know, who isn't moaning about his, his lot at all. But I couldn't compete with that. I just could not compete with... I mean, they just dominated the magazines for about three or four years by sponsoring everybody who'd ever caught a car. And I just, I can't compete with that. And Nutribase, as a lot of bait companies did, took a bit of a kick in. Um, we, we were always all right financially, but the stress built up a bit. It was difficult. Um, and then I think it was 2014, 15, I had a bleed on my brain. I was just sat in the pub one night having a a glass of wine and I felt a bit bizarre. And by the time I'd got home, it was just like, the only thing I can liken it to is somebody clubbing me around the head with a cricket bat. I just cannot imagine anything other than that. Um, And I got rushed into the hospital, all the normal thing, bleed on my brain, going to need either an injection up through your groin uh, or an operation in through your skull. Um, unbelievably, the bleed um, stopped by itself, which is a bit of a miracle, really. But I was six months off work and this, and the company took a bit of a slide then because I hadn't surrounded myself with these good people. No offence to the lads who worked for me, but they didn't run the, the management of the company. They looked after the warehouse and the great job they did of it. But, you know... I was a contact for all our export companies. We were exporting to over 50 countries. They didn't hear from me for six months. Nobody was answering emails for six months. Um, And the company took a bit more of a slide. And when I I come out of hospital, I decided I was going to sell the company. I was going to be no rush to sell it. But, you know, the, the bleed on my brain, they said, was caused by stress. You know, and I'd watch my mum and dad work till they were 75 and then not be bothered to do anything with what they've already worked for. And I thought, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing it. I'm getting out. And it um, took me about two and a half years to sell the company. Uh, eventually sold it and didn't get what was promised because the guy went bankrupt. Um, so, as I said, life is very, very different now. But, you know, I used to... I wouldn't swap my time with YouTube mates for, for a minute, but I used to sit on the loo in the middle of the night thinking about black pepper oil. I used to sit in the bivvy thinking when casing were due in. I don't do any of that anymore. I just worry about Sheffield Wednesday now. And and that's that's all I have to worry about, how my football team's doing. So life's very different for me and the wife, but I'm happy. You know, I'm not I'm not getting any younger. You know, I'm fifty eight now, I love my fishing. I do my writing, I do a bit of consultancy, um, and life's good. But it was the year after I left was shocking, just a dreadful year. And I owe owe an awful lot of people a massive debt of thanks because they stood by me, you know, and they were were so helpful because I'm one of them people who's, I'm a bit insular, I don't discuss things with people. And I didn't, there was about six people on the planet that I've told that had a bleed on my brain. Uh, a couple of mates locally, Tim Paisley, a, few, a handful of others, you know, and then we had an email one day from a, 
our agent in Hungary saying how, how sad it was that I'd died. Oh, and I thought, oh, I need to come clean here. <laughs> yeah. um, Bloody hell. So, yeah, so, so it was very, very difficult. But, hold on a minute. Yeah. Right, daughter borrowing money. Sorry about that. (laughs) (laughs) So no, what? Not too much, was it? No, only twenty quid. Ah, it's all right. She heard you talk uh, about the settlement. That's that's what. Yeah, I I think it was. Yeah. (laughs) So no, what? Life's very, very different. I'm as keen as ever fishing wise. I don't miss. The stresses of running my own business one bit. Um, so there we are. It, it sounds like you've earned it for sure. You know, it, and obviously we, we can't imagine what it's like. But um, yeah, I understand. Letting go of your your company, which you built up for so many years, is. I mean, it's like seeing seeing your ex girlfriend in in the pub with another fella, isn't it? But I suppose. You had to see that every day because you were still working there. So I can only imagine. And then obviously, yeah, between, it just it sounds like a just a horrendous time for you. But um, I mean, when I, every time I went fishing, and weather times were good, weather times were not so good. Every time I went fishing, I'd think about work for the first two days I was there. I'd have a great day and a half in the middle, and then on Thursday I'd be thinking about going back to work again. The phone had never stopped, and you think, I said, I wouldn't swap it for the world, but I wish it was half what people thought. It's you not know, sustainable, I mean, though, is it? No, no, not as you get a bit older. I mean, I used to probably do 20 shows a year in Europe, you know, exhibitions. You know, we weren't big enough to have other people set them up for us, so me and one of the other guys would go out. Um, one of the guys that works at RG Base now, probably enough. Used to go out, set it up on the Friday, do the exhibition Saturday, Sunday, pack it up Sunday night, either bomb it on Monday or bomb it on Sunday night, and on Friday we'd be somewhere else doing it all again. And in between times, we have to do a week at work. Now, I used to do all that easily when I was twenty-eight or thirty. It's a lot harder when you, you know, when you get to, to sort of mid fifties. You know, and it was just, it was killing me. You know, just killing me. And I never I never stopped enjoying it because I love the, the bait and the carp angling side of it. But a lot of the time, the bigger we got, the, when I was watching that John Baker film this afternoon, I thought he still got that enthusiasm, got that. Yeah. A lot of the time for us, we got that big, that quick, that I might as well have been selling biros or women's shoes or, it didn't matter that it was bait. It was just paperwork and red tape and invoicing and, yeah. you know, it was just non-stop, non-stop. Yeah. Oh, good, mate. Well, look, we appreciate you sharing that with us. I know it's, it's you know, it's probably still, a, even though it's been a few years have passed, probably still a raw subject for you. So, like, we really appreciate you, you sharing it with yeah, us. Yeah, le- less so now. As I said, the 18 months afterwards, yeah. I had a couple of chats with people. I said, I'm going to walk away from this fishing game. I've just had enough. Can't trust anybody, all that. Um, but, you know, as spring comes round again, you think, you know, I don't, there's nothing else I could do. You know, it's all I've ever done, really. Mm. You know, the bait and the fishing is all I've ever done. And I thought, you know, I've just got to... And I enjoy my fishing so much now. I mean, I've never... Running your own bait company, I've never felt pressure to catch you know we had loads and loads of of sponsored anglers who were catching i think after 30 years people realized that the baits we were producing caught a few um but i never felt pressure to catch but now i just go without a care in the world and it's nice Mm. you know it's nice i can imagine mate I can imagine, Bill. How are you doing for time? You you, got, you wanting to shoot off? Do you want to? No, I'm fine, you? mate. No, I'm all yours, mate. Or we can split it over another evening, whatever's easiest for you. It's up to you, mate. What would you rather? That might be easier if it's all right yep. with you. I mean, That's I've fine. yeah, I've drunk, I've drunk my bottle of wine, <laughs> <laughs> which might have a bit more to it. 
I'm worried that my I'm worried that my daughter's just disappeared with my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> we Bill, we'll round it up and uh and yeah, we'll do a part two. Thank you so much. We're, no, we'll no problem at all, mate. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, thank you so much and uh we'll catch up with you soon.